Thank you, as always, to the efficient team at Cyber Exchange for putting together another Power Hour. Happy Friday, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever in the world that you are joining us. My name is Ali Hirji, and you know me as the host of the Power Hour, as well as faculty and lead of the Center for Cybersecurity Innovation at Durham College. Now, many times you've heard me say this, that the technology works well when it brings people together. And I want to take you back to the Cyber Exchange 3.0 conference that finished about two and a half, three weeks ago. One of the comments that was made by one of the advisors was around digital transformation and the pace of digital transformation and the cybersecurity matters around it. And when I asked this advisor on what is one challenge that you face when it comes to adopting to this digital transformation and ensuring that your practices are secure, the advisor mentioned the biggest challenge as culture, not the technicalities, not surprisingly even budget to some degree, but emphasized on the point of culture. My guest today is one person that really embodies the kind of cybersecurity culture that you need in order to be effective, progressive, and in order to scale your cybersecurity posture. An individual who not only has touched the public sector, but has gone through many iterations of life in the private sector, and has somehow in his meddlings with technology found himself in the throes of some pretty impressive cybersecurity initiatives across Ontario. So without further ado, my name is Ali Hirji, and I'm joining you from the beautiful city of Oshawa at Durham College. And I'm joined today by someone who's not just a friend, but a mentor to me in a previous life and a previous role that I held. I'm joined today by Luc Hua, the CIO from Laurentian University, all the way from Canada's most resourceful city, the city of Sudbury. Luke, as always, it's a pleasure to chat with you and welcome to the Power Hour. Thank you so much, Ali. And as you know, uh, you're, uh, you've become a, a really good friend and it's always uh, a pleasure. And I'm, of course, uh, out of Sudbury and uh, hopefully our temperatures are similar inside the homes. I see you've got a fireplace, so I'm already <laughs> feeling warmed up. So uh, nice to be here. Thank you. Well, you know, not all of us have the fancy office that you have that you're surrounded with. So I, I had to keep keep up with you, Luke, and, and neither can I travel to Sudbury in a private jet, the one that you have. So there's a lot that I have to aspire to, Luke. Anyways, let's get serious and let's jump into, what is it, 58 minutes of discussion or so. Luke, I want to work with this idea of you being based out of Sudbury. Uh, and, you know, you've mentioned this a lot, that one of the biggest mistakes that folks make in security is to think that they're too small of a target. Now, in comparison to the rest of the GTHA, Sudbury is relatively small. I would never categorize Sudbury in the rural area, but within Northern Ontario, it's one of the most important cities, but a lot smaller from an economic generation perspective than let's say Toronto. But it seems like Sudbury is also becoming an epicenter for cybersecurity activity. Can you tell us a little bit about your location and what's going on there from a security perspective? Luke? Yes, thanks, Ali. That's a great way to start. Um, so we're, Laurentian University is not, a, it's not a small university. It's just the largest in Northern Ontario, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not a large university. Uh, I would scale it to a small, medium-sized university. And um, I think the best way to, to encompass your question is to give you a story. Um, it was March 29, 2018. It was 10 o'clock at night. I already had my two wine, glass wine or glass, uh, glass of wine. And I get an email that from the Canadian Center of Cybersecurity saying that people in our, our organization, faculty members have been victimized by a state actor trying to pull, um, of course, intellectual property of some level. Now you can imagine why at Laurentian University. And this actually, uh, I started digging and it turns out that, uh, especially for stealing intellectual property, there's three areas that they look for quite often and may have changed since then. But back in 2018, they were looking for anything related to technology, anything related to sciences, medical research, which Laurentian is one of them, and also mining and agriculture. And of course, we're a big center for mining. And all of a sudden, 40 of our members got um, roped in into this scheme in sharing intellectual property. 
uh, it's it's it just blows my mind uh, it, how how far they would go. So how do you defend against that? So even if you're in a remote location, doesn't matter where you are in the world, if you've got some interest, I'm sure somebody is trying to pick at it right now. Absolutely, and I think it's really key, as you know, during our days in 2017, 2018, working together on the OnCheck program, we always, always emphasized this aspect of knowing your crown jewels and knowing what kind of IP you have within the work that you're doing that could be used in a different way by a different actor. I just want to park that aside a little bit more because I think as we go further into this conversation, we'll have more discussions about IP and what's resting within academic environments that hackers are interested in or bad actors are interested in. But, you know, you mentioned this thing about like, you know, we've been talking about the geography of Sudbury and you mentioned, you know, being you know slightly remote, but still having a lot of activities that are happening in Sudbury. But no individual is an island. And Luke, as a CIO, you've also had to wear the hat of the security expert. You've also had to lead the security initiatives at the university. From a CIO's perspective, how difficult or how challenging has it been to also now factor in the responsibility of leading security initiatives? Luke? Yeah, and I'm sure that small, medium schools are probably thinking and scratching their head, how do we do this, right? So. The, the one way you mentioned on check, and maybe that's a, a great segue, not a segue, but to answer your, your question is that when I when cyber uh, cyber matters, I'll call them cyber security matters really, you know, came more, uh, I would say frequent, but became more of our uh, attention getter uh, for CIOs. It was, it was back in the 2012 to 15 area. Of course, cybersecurity is always important. We always impose. But really to go at it in a very organized fashion, it needed to happen. That's when it started. And in fact, how do you do that as a small school with limited uh, funding and so on? And you could be a large school and still have limited funding and limited resor- yeah. resources. So in my, in my uh, ap- approach was that I was more afraid of what I did not know. And therefore, that's why we've engaged with uh, uh, five universities and three colleges in Ontario to say, hey, is everybody in the same boat? Would you like to share a CISO? Can you imagine share a CISO? I we, 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 have, uh, we only had half a body dedicated to cybersecurity when all of this started out. And so we needed to, to, to get assistance. And um, that's what OnCheck gave us, uh, which actually became OnCheck um, and uh, the shared CISO. And, um, uh, and, 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 and it gave me at least a, um, a sounding board to know where should be our priorities. Absolutely. And, you know, you've had to build a team around that. You've had to build uh, some very smart individuals around that, not so that you could tell them what to do, but so that they could tell you what to do, which takes me to a question here, Luke. And, you know, today's discussion is meant to be conversational, really get into the mind of a CIO that's now adopting more security practices into his or her portfolio. How easy was it, Luke, to sort of now get told by folks around you about what you need to do. Typically as a CIO, you are the decision maker. Suddenly now you are involved with other folks that are touching the IT systems that also now are, I wouldn't say imposing, but are now directing where the security posture needs to go. How easy was it for you to now have more C-suite representation at the table and more to think about in terms of how you make your decisions? Luke? So, I must confess, I am paranoid by nature, in nature, I should say. And um, I, um, my previous role uh, has been throughout my life as a product manager. And as a product manager, you want to make sure that your product is well-defined and in being sold all over the place. Um, and, and you are, you become accustomed or attuned, at least if you're successful, you come attuned to really listen and really gather all the information and trying to be non-religious religious about your decision-making and so on. So for me, um, it's actually been, um, I think it's been probably easy to listen to other people. What has been challenging is to find out from who I should be listening and who is actually 
funneling all the information to give me better guidance. And that's where the shared CISO really came in. And in fact, uh, one of the first things we did um, with our shared CISO was to tell me the priorities. I mean, we've got uh, so many areas that we can focus in. And um, that's, that's where we started. But nothing is perfect because before we started all of this, uh, the shared CISO program, we had a breach at Laurentian University. And um, it happened because we put our safeguards externally. Uh, you know, we, that's where we put our efforts. But the breach came from within. The breach came from a student uh, within Laurentian University. And when I say breach, we've, we've actually met with the students and all is, all is fine. It's just that um, you can focus anywhere, but when you're starting, you, you are really uh, at risk. And my, one of my counterparts, another school in, in the area of Sudbury, they focus, they learned from us, and they focused internally to really strengthen, and they got attacked externally. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, you got to start as soon as possible. So I'm sure most of you have already started. So, but you got to keep maintaining this. And um, so to answer your question, um, it's, it's been, um, you're going to hear so much, but you really, at the end of the day, you're right. You're the decision maker. And I don't, I don't regret some of the, um, uh, the priorities that we've actually decided. And when I say we, uh, with, with close relationship with my directors here, uh, we've made those decisions. Let's take that a little bit further, because as you know, in security, there are no answers. There's only questions and more questions. Uh, and you're constantly trying to lower the risk appetite, to lower the risk level, uh, and you're mitigating against risk. So there's always some form of risk. One of the things that you've done very well, Luke, is, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you started off as a product manager. And we'll talk a little bit about your career going into the CIO role, because we do have some folks that are watching uh, who are aspiring CISOs, aspiring CIOs. Uh, and folks who are younger as well, who are looking to see what their career paths can look like. So we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on. So thank you to the questions that have come in. But Luke, I want to ask you this about one of the things that you did when security became such a central priority for you is you invested in a lot of training, not just for your staff, but for yourself as well. What were some techniques that you used to ensure that you could actually, given your schedule, given the amount on your plate as a CIO, what were some of those things that you did to ensure that these trainings were actually valuable for you? For example, I remember you at CISO Forum Canada 2019 when you took the CISO certification. What were some best, or what are some best practices that you take in order to ensure that you're garnering the most from such trainings? As, as a CIO, it's quite challenging because at the end of the day, you're not paid to just do cybersecurity. You're actually paid to you know, make sure the operation of university is smooth, the services are there, and you really enrich even the experience of students, for example, and researchers and faculty members. So you, what's been challenging is how do you actually decide when to put in the time to yeah. do, whether it's training, like in, the, in that case, back in 2019, and I did actually attend a CC, a, a, cert, a certification, a CISO certification training. And um, at the end of the day, it was less about getting a certification. It was more about how do I insert myself in, in those practices and, and become and think like a, you know, a security expert or at least a very knowledgeable security person. So therefore, when you're actually getting feedback, you can actually ask questions intelligently. Um, so that, that was my, one of the major investment. And the other major investment, of course, has been I've actually rolled up my sleeves and put a training together at Laurentian University for our staff and faculty. Because, you know, we know that they can felt they, they can be victimized by, you know, bad emails, bad attachments, bad links, and so on. And that was the other part. So I was able to take that, put up some training, and make it, make it so um, easy to understand. And so, for example, don't open, don't click, don't save, period. I mean, it's simple as that, for example. Yep. And, and, that, that, uh, and, and I've got some real data to, to kind of show about that. When we first did our training uh, on campus, 
we basically at um, about 92, well, I'll say exactly 92.8% of our folks had security awareness, but we still had a gap. When we did, after we did the training, we measured again, and we were up to 99.2%, which in the grand scheme of things, we went from 120 people who had poor security awareness to only about eight. And that is a great, uh, a great accomplishment, what training can do. So from the start of learning about cybersecurity, making the time for it and applying it and sharing it within your, your, um, uh, your community has been, has been one of the top things, top uh, accomplishments uh, for us. What gets measured gets done. And having worked with Luke in my previous life at Orion, I can tell you uh, he's a man of numbers, a man of metrics, and more importantly, a man of, a man of analytics. Uh, because as I've said before, data can have a lot of insights in it. And uh, eyesight is useless if insight is blind. You've got to bring context to all of that data. And I think, Luke, you know, the context that you just shared, for all the folks who are listening, if you want to measure the efficacy of your security programs, you're hearing it from him in terms of how you need to set some baselines and some benchmarks. So thank you, Luke, for that. Luke, you know, you've been around for a very, very long time. And, you know, as the running joke used to go, you know, Luke provided customer service to Adam and Eve and they enrolled into university, so on and so forth, managing all sorts of different devices. You've been there, you've seen a lot. Now within the university sector, you're having to engage academics, you're having to engage students, you're having to engage administrators and these awareness programs. One of the things that you've been looking into is gamifying some of that engagement. I know you've shown some interest in the esports cyber environment, which we all saw as members of the Cyber Exchange 3.0 board uh, and is going to be featured also at CISO Forum Canada 2021. Um, you've been looking at these new gamified environments, more fun, more rewarding like environments. Can you tell me a little bit about where do you see the future of security awareness programming and why is gamification suddenly a very central element to your work as well. Luke? Anybody who's in the university sector really understands that uh, for students to really capture and learn, one of the great ways is to gamify anything. Um, but to gamify something, to, to caution everybody, is that it needs time. It needs really thinking it through and making the game not only just fun, but also it matters. Um, and that's, that's what we, um, we like doing over here. Um, sometimes it doesn't come out as a gamification, but maybe it comes out as a video, maybe it comes out as a little tutorial of some kind. But you got to have it in such a way that you engage and, and you have the student actually being involved or the faculty member being involved. And um, I've actually uh, have a, a lot of interest on the uh, cyber exchange tools because they actually you know, really demonstrate the, the strength and, and the opportunity uh, of, uh, of, of a gamifying uh, learning about cybersecurity. Yeah, I think one of the trends that we're also seeing right now, so for example, in our own practice at the Center for Cyber, is you've got your learning management systems, but we're now moving into, at least pedagogically, into the space of learning engagement systems. And we're talking about systems wherein, based on your learning patterns, you're now getting text messages about a particular situation. You're getting a quick email, maybe even getting a, uh, another ping of some sorts that's telling you, hey, what would you do in so-and-so situation? It's really about understanding the context around learning. Uh, and to the audience that's watching, I highly recommend uh, when they're, they're uploaded onto On Demand, watch those esports cyber sessions and how they've taken Monopoly-like games and suddenly derive tabletop exercises out of it. 60 minutes of commitment, you get to roll a dice, you get to play certain situations, you get to role play and have fun at it. And there's a lot of research out there that suggests that learning happens a lot and are at its best during those kind of scenarios. So I uh, highly recommend for those of you that are interested to go and check out those videos or uh, check out the eSports Cyber site uh, and connect with the team uh, for more. Luke, let's work with this just a little bit more. And this, when it comes to awareness programming uh, and training, so on and so forth, this is a question that's come in and, and I'll reshape it just a little bit because I can see the... Um, the area that this is coming from, given that you're based in academe, Luke, are you seeing now a push or are you pushing for a cybersecurity course to be mandatory 
for any degree program that is out there. Now, I know you sit more on the administrative side and the leadership capacity, less on academic impact, but I'm sure you have some, some say in academic programming. What's your take on uh, implementing one mandatory security course? So I, I apply it a little bit about having budgeting skills or life skills to be able to manage your life. Yep. Cyber cybersecurity is actually one of those things. Um, you don't need to. You should not be uh, needed to be convinced on that, um, because we can fell prey. Just like somebody says, you know, you got to watch your nest egg. You can't just invest anywhere. Do your well. It's no different. You can maybe lose it like this with just one, you know, bad click on the link. Yep. So it's it's. Um, I definitely promote it on the on the admin side. Um, it is not yet mandatory, but we actually do test and uh, everybody. And we also, when we test them, if they fail, it is mandatory that they take the training. So yeah. some people come with, you know, some skills, some, uh, I would say, the dexterity regarding cybersecurity. But those who don't, no matter what, if you get caught, you're in the training. So that's another way to do it, but absolutely. And um, I, 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 I converse with our uh, faculty members, let's say, and um, to bring in some kind of uh, topic like that as a course comes with its own challenges, but it's always doable. Absolutely. And I think a challenge is a matter is an opportunity it just depends on perspective. Life, after all, as my dad always tells me, is how you look at it. However, numbers don't lie. And I mentioned Luke to be a, a, a numbers person, somebody analytically driven. Here comes a CIO now that is looking at security extremely seriously, wants to put some programming in place. And the question comes up about financing. Now we know this very well, people know the price of everything and the value of nothing and the value of security is priceless. But Luke, as a CIO making budget asks and then in difficult circumstances, also ensuring that systems are in place, staff is in place to run an adequate security program, not a security program that is 50% where it needs to be, but at 100% firing. What were some of the things that you did as a CIO in terms of your budgeting? How did you think about your priorities from a budget perspective? It's quite challenging, I'll be honest. Um, you got to put it in context of risks. And in fact, that's what I was working on right before the call. We're actually working on a different way of demonstrating risk. I, in my, um, my slides that I do in my, in my presentations to budget committees and so on, I love to show, as you, as you know, Ali, to love to show data, show, show kind of the big picture of what the risks are. And when you show, it's better to show many risks than just one, and then have a way to scale those risks. So people have no other choice to say, okay, we're gonna invest here instead of there. Now they're investing, or, or I should say now they're vested. Instead of showing, hey, we have one risk and that's where we need your, the." And so that's been a little bit of a trick uh, of mine. The other one, unfortunately, is that when we had our breach back in 2017, um, we, we then said, hey, we need money for, for you know, to prevent these things, or at least to analyze traffic profiles, behaviors, yeah. and to be able to act upon it. But then it's a little bit too late uh, when you think about it. So, yeah. um, and also on that particular example, it taught me that what I asked for may have not been the top priority as well. And that's why working with the CISO and engaging with the community actually comes in really well where to, to focus on. You know, you've really focused on this element of community, right? And this is why, you know, I said at the very get-go, one of the biggest threats to digital transformation and for that matter, security is culture. You've got to breed the right culture. And collaboration has been at the heart of what you've done. Besides the on-chat program, have you also found yourself collaborating with the municipality, with, uh, with other institutions, with, with industry? What are some of the collaborations that have emerged after you've taken this really deep and unique journey into cybersecurity? Yeah, there's, there's, um, there's, there's, there's a few, and the two of them that comes to mind is just within our region here, we meet regularly as CIOs. 
And, uh, and also when we were starting the on chat program, I was also communicating with them saying, Hey, this is coming, you know, this is the value you'll be getting, give me some input at the same time and, and involving with that. So that's been very positive. And since then we're also, I'm also engaged with Canary at the national yeah. level in terms of uh, trying to figure out ways to measure uh, cybersecurity. So whether it's risks or also uh, how do you actually, how, how much should you invest and, and see where those investments compare to your stature on, on cybersecurity. So absolutely. So I'm, I'll, I'll be honest. I, um, in, I'm not one to put my hat on to say, I'm a cybersecurity guy. I yeah. became a cybersecurity guy because of necessity, not because of what I wanted to do. And, and that's, it's unfortunate, but it's also a reality. So, um, but I'm, I'm, and that's why I'm, I'm no, I'm no uh, expert whatsoever, but I appreciate you mentioning me on the leadership aspect because you know, when we, when we started the, uh, the shared CISO program, the on check program, we had commented between CIOs in Ontario that we all want to collaborate, but we don't. How, why is that? We do poorly at collaboration. And I use this as an example of how we can collaborate. And in fact, we've got CANSOC that collaborates across Canada. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to see, and it's all possible. So I would suggest that even if you're a small community, I would even suggest even if you're competitors, you might as well work together because typically IT can give you a competitive edge, but also IT can actually make you stronger when you work with other organizations and try to figure out a way to collaborate on things like cybersecurity. Um, so those, those are some of the, the lessons learned and uh, the values that I got from all the collaboration that we've done. Absolutely. And, you know, you've been a pioneer of this cybersecurity collaboration, what may I call it, transit, transit-like system, where instead of people traveling in their independent silos, you've brought them together. Now, Luke, it's one thing to bring the leadership team together. And, and you know, you've said this, uh, I, I clearly remember this in 2017 when we were putting together the team around OnCheck is, you know, I'm not necessarily looking for the right technical skill set. I'm looking for the mindset. Uh, and a good friend of mine has always said, you know, we hire for skill and then we fire for fit because you have to assess that mindset. But one of the things that becomes extremely challenging once you've got the right people at the table is also to support the technical teams with sandboxes, with environments where they can test and where they can train. Red team, blue like uh, blue team like environments, purple team like environments. Are you finding it easy now with all of these collaborations to create scenarios where, and I use this term very carefully, but where you can indulge in some form of controlled cyber war games, where you can indulge in some sort of simulations. Are you seeing that coming out of these collaborations as well? Yes, absolutely. And I think, I think one of the, the cool things that we've done in collaboration is that we've actually engaged with uh, our um, local RAN or regional area network expert, Orion. And they, they, through this collaboration, because they knew it was driven by the universities, and although they're not universities, they offer a service to the public sector, they became more attuned to listen to some of our demands. And they've been great at adapting at that. And I, I speak for Orion, but I'm sure it's the same for Siberia and everywhere else, yep. uh, BCNet and so on. Uh, it's, it's the same elsewhere. Um, because because it's, it's a culture to collaborate. I think, you know, maybe, you know, I come from a small village of 350 people. Um, they... How would I say that? We're, we're, we were like pioneers. And pioneers are typically more to collaborate because you can't do it all by yourself. And I would argue that if you really want to collaborate, go back to your roots as a pioneer and ask for help because it's amazing. And once you get into that culture, all of a sudden people are very open-minded. And again, making sure that when you start, you said it well, Ali, make sure you've got the right mindset of the people. Because if you got somebody who doesn't have the right mindset, it's going to be very difficult to take off. So 
absolutely were um, some of the some of the results from this has been um, you know maybe less related to uh, to to what you mentioned Ali but but for example training for example uh, fun and games absolutely another one is it sounds so simple but it's an executive dashboard on how to communicate to the board of your status and I've got a single slide that gives you the six areas of measurement and gives you a clear picture of your status on, on security. Can you imagine? Of course, it doesn't have all the details. It gives you that snapshot and it's a great one to show year after year. So you can show progress, you can show threats actually increasing as they go along. This is an example of a great collaboration uh, that came out and there's many other ones too. Absolutely. And just for our audience, I know Luke was very humble in mentioning he comes from a small town. Uh, what Luke doesn't mention is that he was the king of that small town uh, and he was addressed as your holiness. Um, so, yes, going forward, we will refer to him as your holiness or your highness. You pick and you choose. All right. We've got about 28 more minutes and a few questions have come in, some in the chat and some direct message. So thank you, everybody, for bringing in your questions. I do want to take the conversation into a little bit of a more personal touch with Luke as we go a little bit forward. But of course, your questions are always welcome. Uh, this question, Luke, comes from a very good friend of mine. His name is Tyrone, uh, Tyrone Lobo. I, I forget. He, he wears many hats. But yesterday, I had spoken to him about these very innovative mobile data center solutions. So I'll probably share with you some things about that as well. But Tyrone uh, asks two very interesting questions. The first question that he asks is, can you share the dashboard slide of security status? So, you know, the, the slides that you were talking about. Um, so, yes, uh, Tyrone, uh, uh, Luke is nodding affirmative. So we'll have Luke sort of share some resources uh, when he's back from vacation after next week. Uh, I am the only thing standing in between him and his vacation. So once uh, his vacation is done, he will share those resources on the Cyber Exchange platform. Uh, Tyrone's question is, an interesting one where he says, how much is the reputation of the university or the academic body a driver for funding and security? Your thoughts, Luke? Yeah, that's, that's, it's actually a good question. It's, um, it used to be when we started out, it used to be our number one thing that we would mention. Yep. It would be bad reputation if something happens. These days, I would say that it's still, it still matters, but it's not the driving force. At the end of the day, you could be losing money. You could become inoperable. Something happens, and all of a sudden, your resources need to be put on a breach or anything like that. That's what actually has a big impact. Another impact, we have cybersecurity insurance. Maybe our, our, our claim is going to go way higher, and we have to defend, defend, defend. It's, 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 um, so reputation is definitely not a good thing. I mean, in terms of if it gets impacted, absolutely. But it's the impact on not being able to operate and maybe missing a payroll, maybe missing opportunities to, um, to um, uh, how would I say that, recruit students in our case, maybe to recruit customers in some of the private industry. That's the major impact. And um, so, so reputation. And also, I'll go back to the um, uh, to coming from a small village um, in California. They uh, they used to call me my my friends anyway. Um, they used to call me the the village idiot. <laughs> so, but it, it was it was meant in a really good way, and and I say it like that because you know it's the. How would I say that? It's it's a simple, modest person that can actually make a lot of differences awesome. and can make things happen. But even better, bring people in to make something even bigger. And 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 that's um, so. I do come from a small village. Yes, I was not re referred to the king though, but that's okay. <laughs> Look, you remind me of what my dad always, or rather my mom always reminds me of this statement, right? Which is, you know, each drop in the ocean is an ocean in and off of itself. And you got to value what you've got. So, you know, well said, Luke. And, and the mindset that comes with individuals who have had to be resourceful, 
who have had to think about how to pool resources together can be very, very interesting, especially in the shoes of uh, a CIO who's now also wearing the hat of the security lead, so on and so forth. Now, speaking about this piece about, um, you know, you've, you've talked about your journey, right? You're coming from a small town, you've spent time in California, et cetera. I know this is a little bit of a sensitive area, but I think it's an important timely area. And I didn't, you know, I'll take 30 seconds and contextualize this for you. Over the last three to four months, whenever I've begun sessions, I've and I've been doing it remotely. I've always been very clear in you know welcoming my guests, but also saying that uh, we're transmitting across digital lines, across the internet, and the internet constitutes indigenous space as well. Because our fiber optic cables, our cables in general, our, our networks, our aerial networks run across indigenous land, period. You do have an indigenous background and you've become a little bit of a, at least for me in my formative years at Orion, bit of a mentor, a bit of a poster child of where things can go if you apply yourself. What do you think is needed to start engaging more talent in cybersecurity, more diverse talent, and also to bring in more Indigenous youth into the fold of cybersecurity professionals? What do you think we can do as, you know, I dare say I fall into this category now as well of people who are leading different initiatives and can also be doing more. What more can someone like me be doing? Luke? Oh, that's a lot of question. Yeah. Um, and and um, maybe for, for some of, of you who don't understand, sometimes the um, I'm trying to think of how best to portray this. So imagine we have fiber, like Ali says, we have fiber to uh, indigenous land or territories and reserves and so on. But quite often, <laughs> the connection is not to the home. It, 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 it ends it, and not connected at home. So how do you involve more uh, of our uh, indigenous community? Well, give them services, you know? So how, how do we actually, um, you know, do that? Well, it, it's true um, working, uh, promoting government programs, promoting governments to invest more um, and, and, and to, to, to be an advocate for that, because, um, you know, our, our indigenous society are, are, are for universities anyway, they are our, our biggest growth in terms of when you look at a sector um, and which is wonderful. Um, you know, they're, they're what I what I actually appreciate because I have a trailer and it's parked uh, on Manitoulin Island and we deal with a lot of. Uh, a lot of indigenous, and they just bring a perspective, just like women bring a different perspective. I always said women, they have a sixth sense. Um, you can say sick in some cases, but number six sense. They, everybody brings a perspective. Guys are good too. It's just that everybody brings, and, and I'm, I'm really happy you brought, brought that up because we need to, to broaden those perspectives so we can even become richer and stronger as a community, especially for cybersecurity. I agree with you 100%. And I think, you know, a couple of lessons learned in what you shared over the last minute is, this is why a CIO's perspective on security is so important because, you know, you mentioned the connectivity piece and that's infrastructure related. The kind of insight that you have on how connectivity is delivered, whether aerial, whether ground network, so on and so forth. I mean, my exposure to this was primarily under Darren Graham uh, at Orion and then uh, with the rest of the team at Orion, you know, and understanding how connectivity services are delivered, then understanding the cosmics around uh, Contact North for that matter and different facilities that are out there. A CIO's perspective gets to see how digital infrastructure is delivered uh, and then layering on security onto that, the perspective piece that you bought in. One of the lessons I learned when CyberX hosted the Global Cyber Olympics with us at Durham College some of the teams that came from the Netherlands, Germany, I think a team from Nigeria, there was a team from Canada as well. I would say in the team of six, you probably had two hardcore security professionals. There was The rest was somebody in philosophy, somebody in languages and semantics, another person in psychology. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to security, and you think about the indigenous knowledge that you can bring to the table, one of the things that I've always emphasized is how in indigenous traditions you think about language codes, how people talk in code languages, how people talk in signs, all have meaning and hidden meaning within them. 
And if you're able to draw from some of those practices and bring them into your vulnerability analysis for that matter, your threat hunting for that matter, it is such rich context. Speaking of context, Luke, you've been an individual that many times, and I don't mean to stereotype anybody with this, perhaps you can stereotype me, once we have drunk that juice of being part of the public sector, we never go anywhere else. You, on the other hand, have come from the private sector, but you continue to maintain a lot of the lessons learned from the private sector in the work that you do. Can you tell our audience a little bit about what was your journey like in the private sector? How did you get into the public sector? And why have you stayed as a CIO now dabbling into security? Luke? Yeah, the, I mean, uh, all sectors are wonderful. Um, and, and I've learned a lot of things uh, on the private sector on how to become efficient, how to drive, how to focus. Um, and in fact, I was play, explaining that to, to one of my team members this morning. You know, when you're in the private sector, you're doing a startup, you're really focused in one area. But when you become in the public uh, sector, you're more of a, you know, you're more open, you're more wide in terms of what you need to offer. And it totally changes your, your, your perspective. So all of a sudden, it's not just a matter of, I need more money to do one thing. All of a sudden, it's like, I've got lots of things I need to do. So where do I prioritize? And, and I, I, you have to be a little bit of a diplomatic uh, as a CIO to be able to, to, um, to receive those funds or whatever it is. So um, yeah, I'll leave it there. And, and I don't think I've answered all your questions, but maybe you can strive me from there. Guide no, me from. I think you know what you meant. The key word that you brought up there was the diplomacy and realizing that cybersecurity is not an individual practice. There's team dynamics that you have to think of at the table. Um, there's learning how to manage not just team dynamics, but the expectations uh, from vendors, the expectations from your, your patrons, the expectations from students, et cetera. And I think what you learn in the private sector uh, which you can, which you bring very strongly into the public sector is that element of customer service, knowing that even in that C-suite position, those basics of customer service, how you respond to that email, how you take that call, how you take criticism, all go into developing the leaders of the future. I have no shame. And I know we have quite a few students that watch this. In fact, Luke, I allowed my students to skip class so that they could hear from the one and only Luke Hua. His holiness. But, uh, you know, one of the things I tell them all the time is I myself aspire to one day be in those positions of a CIO, a CTO, whatever have you. And the technical things I can learn, but it's those soft skills that you've brought to the table, bringing people together, knowing how to respond, not distancing yourself from the fires when they're out there, but knowing how to approach these situations all are lessons that you can bring and lead together pretty interestingly. So thank you, Luke, uh, for sharing that personal perspective. We have about another 15 more minutes, and I want to dive a little bit more into some of the, in the landscape that you're seeing right now. Um, besides everything that has happened through the pandemic, to the start of the pandemic, now we're sort of seeing ourselves in a hybrid mode. Are there any particular types of threats or vulnerabilities that are really important to you and top of mind? given the shifting landscape that we're in every other day. Luke? So there is. Um, the, um, uh, I, I would say that recently, in the last two to three years, I've actually worked closer to our VP research uh, for multiple reasons, but cybersecurity is one thing that really concerns everybody but how do you act upon it? And what's really concerning is, uh, I mean, there are some fundamentals that we're probably, we still need to make sure the fundamentals are done. Where do you store your data safely? Well, um, you know, for example, using a USB stick. Oh my God, you know, that's maybe less of a, a logical threat than more of a physical threat. But yeah. those are the things that, that matters. But what's really concerning uh, which is growing is we have state actors that are act actually becoming, um, how would I say that politely? They're becoming other researchers and they're trying to infiltrate and they're trying to, you know, and, and they're trying to be part of the community. It's almost, it's basically like a spy. And how do you defend a spy? I mean, 
it's so difficult. Um, so we, we actually train our research community to say, well, do more uh, research on the individual, more research on the organization that they may be representing. Look at their background, if they've done, if they, uh, you know, what have they accomplished and really uh, verify uh, though, you know, everybody who might be involved in a research, depending on the level of research and on the level of research, you know, what most people don't realize is that something that may appear um, like civ for civilian application can be used against from a military perspective. Oh, yeah. Flip it around and all of a sudden you've got a military weapon. It's unreal that the threat. So that's why you really need to, um, how would I say that? really need to care for any project that you're doing, whether it's storing, but also the members that are involved. And that's, that's what's keeping uh, us uh, a little bit busy these days. Yeah, they say, right, the best form of defense is attack. And in this case, we're not saying launch your own attacks against adversaries, but be proactive in your cybersecurity posture. And I want to just re reference something that you mentioned about the, the networks that are formed around bad actors, the business of bad actors and how they operate. About two weeks ago, I ran a session with Kaspersky. You may know, the audience may know that I, I run a quarterly show called In the Node with leaders from Kaspersky and their immediate circle. And we're talking about ransomware as a service and ransomware as a corporation. And looking at how bad actors now have established companies where they create malware, where they create different types of attacks and then they sell it. And members who are a part of that cohort have benefits, have vacation, have days off, so on and so forth. And if you're not aware, ignorance, as Luke has very eloquently said, is not an excuse. You need to know what you do not know. And I think, Luke, this is why when you've participated in different conferences, you've participated in different advisory groups, it's been very helpful for you because you've got to hear about different perspectives and you've got to hear about different narratives. Good cybersecurity professionals are great storytellers. And uh, the amount of stories I'm sure you've heard at conferences have definitely opened you up to some new realities. Speaking about future threats and vulnerabilities, Luke, where do you see from a university perspective, from an academic delivery perspective, we're start, we've been hearing quite a lot about the university on the cloud, you know, the, the, the digital university, the digital academe. Now with this push on around hybrid and uncertainty around COVID, so on and so forth, how are you preparing for this environment which is truly imagining the university entirely online? What are some of the things that you do as a CIO to be prepared for this? And um, where do you see trends heading? Yeah, we, we just posted, uh, in fact, internally, the approval of a, a new position. Some of the largest schools have already had it, but uh, we refer to it as a DevSecOps. Uh, we, in fact, we posted that position a few years ago. It's just that we were not able to fill it in. And oh, wait, hey, if somebody's interested, you send me an email. Um, yeah. The DevSecOps, I mean, just, just the name itself, it's not a developer, it's not a security, it's not an operations people, person. It's actually everything. And, and they are uh, more involved, especially in cloud environments to really ensure that the exchanges, the integration, even the work performed by the cloud provider is within our security framework. And, and that's, that's, um, that's been actually, uh, in the last few years, that's been quite impressive how it had actually evolved. And that's one, just one area. Um, when, when did we actually, you know, uh, 10 years ago, we didn't think about a cloud security framework of some kind, or at yeah. least related to that. Now we do. In fact, there's so many services out there that offers ways to actually prevent, uh, you know, potential cybersecurity issues and so on. But they all have to be vetted. So I think that um, it's 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 going inside of your own uh, data center, going to the cloud. This is always going to be moving from one place to other years over years. I've seen it. If some of you are old like me, they'll remember the Centrex service from uh, a telephone service. It was sitting in the cloud, but we never referred to the cloud, but it was sitting at the carrier's perspective. And then it came back in house. Now it's actually going uh, as UCAS uh, externally. Those are the, that's always going to be going. 
but you got to be able to adjust as as things progress. And that's that's a big thing being a CIO and managing IT. We're civil servants at the end of the day for our community, and we need to adjust and stay at the forefront of that adjustment. You know, they say, right, intelligence is about the ability to adjust to change or adapt to change. Um, and if there's anybody here who's exuding that intelligence, it is Luke Roy. I was about to say uh, L for intelligence, L for Luke, but then I realized intelligence is spelled with an I. So thank God I did not repeat that. And I contextualized it the way I did. Well done, Ali, a couple of brownie points my way. We got about seven minutes left. And Luke, there's one question that's come in, which I was anticipating. Uh, I didn't come earlier on, but it's coming now. And that has to do with social engineering. And the question is not tell us about social engineering. The question is, do you have any fun stories around an interesting social engineering attack? Luke? Well, uh, luckily not, not in, in my environment, uh, right. although there were attempts in at Laurent University, but I've heard how they actually were deployed and, and there, there were impacts uh, in other schools. Um, the, the, the worst one that I've, well, I say that the most with the one that with the fa- biggest financial impact is uh, you are a provider or you claim you are a provider and you basically say, hey, you know, we've moved, we have a change of email, change of address. And even though you verified the website looks legit, everything looks legit, it's amazing how a simple phone call yeah. can actually prevent any issues. But we've seen that. We've seen things with a, um, uh, a payroll, a pay advice that actually is sent and it's a wrong pay advice where they ask you to confirm again your deposit and then somehow they change it so it's deposited somewhere else. This has happened. It's, um, uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's not good. Some of the funny ones though is, you know, when I said training, you gotta do measurements, you gotta do, you gotta perform tests and, um, Sometimes it's funny because some people will send you an email saying, uh, uh, I didn't fall for it, but in fact, they did. They just don't want to admit that they will, that they did. But we all track that, of course. And, uh, but it's not, it's not a punitive environment. You make sure that they learn from it and it stays with them. Uh, and we always tell them, what you learn here at school is also applicable at home. So there's a lot of value there to, to you know, prevent, uh, you know, issues, so. Don't let your education come in the way of your learning, Luke, espousing wisdom in the classroom and outside. Luke, last question for you, and then we'll come to some closing remarks. Luke, busy schedule, you know, my CIO of a fairly large university, security portfolio on your hands, you know, growing fa- you know, family, lots of other commitments as well. You continue to make time to be a part of, for example, CISO Forum Canada 2021. You were at Cyber Exchange 3.0. Why are such conferences, especially the CISO Forum, why are such conferences really important for you? And why do you always make sure to participate in some shape or fashion? Yeah, that's, you know, when the learning experience of the OnCheck program has been, you know, it's as important to provide to your community than it is um, for your own personal good. And, and that's why I like being involved. Um, I love to share uh, thoughts, uh, make people think sometimes of some of the questions you pose, learn from it as well. Um, and, and to me, you know, as a society, uh, the cyber, cyber risks is really a societal issue. It's not just an organizational issue. And we have to help each other. And that's why I stay involved because I feel like I've, my learning experience from collaboration can really be shared. And I know some of my peers actually have the same thing and I applaud them because they, they grow out there, they go even uh, beyond Ontario, beyond Canada to share their expertise and way to go, good job. Absolutely, and I'll add to that and say, you know, myself being a part of a variety of conferences, especially the CyberX uh, core, um, it, it's essential to your health as well. It's, it's your mental well-being when you get to share some of your vulnerability, share some of your nervousness in a safe environment. 
uh, and learn from others, hear others on stage, learn how they're presenting their ideas. I always say this, especially to the folks who are listening to this who have a technical bent. You know, the world doesn't have a shortage of uh, good developers, of good coders, of good pen testers, but we do have a shortage of good pen testers who can communicate well, who can work in a team well, who can work in a business environment well and understand ROI. And these conferences really allow you to drill into that. However, I know that the team from CyberX is watching very intently. The real reason why they have to get Luke to all of their conferences is that the crowd refuses to support any agenda without Luke on it. I still remember CISA Forum 2019, Luke walks on stage and the cheers and the claps. 2020, I moderated the session with Luke. It was Friday, 4.30 p.m. and we had highest attendance on that, all due to Luke. Luke, final question for you, and then we'll come to a closing statement. So if not IT, if not CIO, if not in the world of product management and security and all of that fun stuff, what do you think Luke would have been doing? Mm. Well, <laughs> I always uh, I always thought that I was going to be one to drive a truck that delivers the um, you know beers or uh, or the Pepsi back in my little community. It was always something special. Whenever you see the uh, the cola truck arrive and then come out with those cases, yes, I'm dating myself, but I've seen that and I've seen the community come around so happy that it came in. And I always thought myself of, yeah, you know, um, I was told at one startup, they said, Luke, I don't think you'll be, you would be good enough in a startup because you're, you're too nice. And I see that as value actually, because, you know, the more you're nice, in some in some ways, the more you will attract people, and the more you'll attract good people, and and it's all about empowering them. Um, and um, so, it's a good question. Um, you know, maybe I'd become a barista so I can offer a really good espresso. Well, listen, Luke, if you can speak to the ice cream man who revolves around my community, never stops in front of my house. You'd make me very happy if you can tell him that story and remind him, please stop in front of my house and give me adequate warning. With that, Luke, I know I'm coming in between your much-deserved vacation. Luke, I'm going to ask you to stay on while I bid the audience adieu so that you and I can just have 30 seconds in the green room to say goodbyes. But Luke, on behalf of not just myself, the, the crew that puts together the Power Hour, the Cyber Exchange Committee, but all of the audience members that we've had today, thank you so much for your time, Luke. If there's one thing that I've learned, rather two things that I've learned, you know, I went back to... Um, uh, Matthew Balser from Sentinel One during Cyber Exchange 3.0 mentioned something which was so powerful. He said, we've got a lot of data and we know that, but don't dump data, dump context. And I paid a lot of attention to how you would throw us a certain data point, but then provide context around it. And I see exactly why that is essential. Secondly, you know, you reminded me a lot of uh, some sayings from my parents, but now they've always told me that uh, always make sure that you're listening to understand as opposed to listening to reply. And seeing how you've conducted yourself with someone junior like myself, listening to what I'm saying and then thoughtfully composing your responses. I think it has lessons around leadership for not just CIOs and CISOs, but leaders and leadership techniques in general. So Luke, once again, thank you for your time. Please stay on to our audience. I hope you enjoyed this wonderful session with Mr. Luke Hua, a good friend, a mentor, and somebody who I know that if you reach out to him whenever he has some time, he will gladly have a chat with you. As Luke also mentioned, he is hiring for a DevSecOps engineer or somebody with a DevSecOps mindset. So if you are interested, you can ping him on the Cyber Exchange platform, and I'm sure he will connect with you. Uh, a couple of more Power Hour sessions are being scheduled for the month of August. Quite a few folks are on vacation, except myself, uh, but I will make sure to release the series of the next Power Hours very, very shortly on the Cyber Exchange platform. There are going to be some fantastic sessions also coming up with the province of Ontario with Julia Lee. Hack with Helen. Uh, I believe there's a show with Kush Sharma as well. And there are going to be some live streaming of the esports cyber games coming very, very soon. And for those of you who can see it in the lower thirds, there is a mention of CISO Forum Canada 2021. Registration for that opens next week, including the call for papers. This event is going to be a hybrid event where, believe it or not, we might see each other in person in some shape or fashion. I know I'll be getting my tickets. Well, I better get a ticket. I'm on the advisory board along with Luke. If I don't, we will have other problems with the team from CyberX. This is Ali Hirji signing out. Happy Friday. Stay safe. Stay healthy.